Well, thank you for attending my session. Um, I realized I didn't send a bio or anything. So really, this is a surprise for everyone. Um, I like these to be kind of a discussion versus uh, me just yakking. So I'm gonna like ask questions and stuff. So, you know, try to interact with you all. So um, let's see, let's get this going. So hi everyone, I'm Dan, um, Dan Buck, he, they pronouns. I'm the director of educational equity with Outfront Minnesota. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Outfront, um, our mission is to create a state where lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people are free to be who they are, love who they love, and live without fear of violence, harassment, or discrimination. You know, basically we just want everybody to live their lives um, the best they can and do everything that everybody else gets to do. And, um, you know, do things like go to work, pay student loans, retire. Um, we, have, we envision a state where LGBT individuals have equal opportunities, are working towards a day when all Minnesotans have the freedom and power confidence to make the best choices for themselves. My goal as Director of Educational Equity is to work myself out of a job. I go into schools and I work with administrators and teachers and staff, faculty, whatever, to ensure that LGBTQ kids are treated like humans. And it would be nice to not have to do that work anymore because they are. Unfortunately, I've got a lot of job security um, in that realm. Um, our agenda. So quick intros, uh, ground rules, terms, definitions, statistics, information, questions, and closing. But like I said, there's going to be opportunities here. I'm going to ask questions. I would really love you, if, you know, if you would just dialogue with me a little bit. It's um, less tedious than listening to me talk. So introductions. Um, we're not going to do this part, but um, I do want to say, ask, you know, what is, to, to kind of like base set and, you know, ground ourselves, what is one thing you have to leave at the door today to be open to this material? You know, whether it's assumptions about the LGBTQ community or um, the fact that it's raining and probably turning into ice halfway across the state, whatever. Um, just let's think about that thing for a second, that one thing you have to check at the door um, to be present. So some ground rules. Um, confidentiality. Uh, Anything that I say, the words coming out of my mouth, the slides and everything, obviously, this is why I'm here. I want you to use these. I want you to take this information and share it. But if somebody shares a personal story or something about themselves, um, that's theirs to share. And if you find it compelling, if you think it's something that might somebody else might find useful, please get their permission first before you share it, because um, that is their story to share. Uh, impact versus intent, we're all trying here. Um, we're going to slip up. We're going to misgender. We might um, use a wrong name. Uh, we might say something that we think is, you know, um, is, is, you know, whatever, but um, somebody else might find a little offensive or a lot offensive. We're trying our best here. Um, so, you know, if we mess up, we try to fix it and move on. Um, ask questions. As, as we're going through this, holler out a question. If I, you know, if you just want to fit it into the space, please take that space. Um, you don't have to worry about using the thumbs up or clap. I mean, if you want to clap, feel free, knock yourself out. But uh, you don't have to use the thumbs up because I can't see them. Um, so be comfortable knowing all the questions, all your questions are not gonna get answered. Um, but I will give my email at the end of the presentation. So if you have further questions or if you have any comments or concerns or anything, please reach out to me. That's why I'm here. Um, so why are we here? Why am I giving this presentation? This is a presentation I give to uh, the non-student side of K-12 education all the time. And the reason I'm using this is because the theme of building bridges, um, we're trying to build bridges here. We're trying to um, bridge the gap between uh, people who don't understand pronouns or have misunderstandings about trans folks. We're trying to like find that ground where we can understand where each person is coming from um, and who they are and why they are the way they are. Um, the main thing about this presentation is it is really about safety and I'll get into that later, but LGBTQ plus youth are at risk and they need and deserve our support. Um, cis kids, cis straight kids suffer from depression and thoughts of self-harm or acts of self-harm. Absolutely true. Um, gay, lesbian, um, bisexual kids like double the rate. Transgender non-binary kids triple the rate. This is about safety for all kids. Um, and I wanna emphasize every child deserves a safe learning environment and help um, when battling depression or other things. Um, national studies have shown that 71% of LGBT youth reported discrimination due to either sexual orientation or gender identity. 
Um, this, these stats come from Glisten. If you're not familiar with them, they have all kinds of incredible stats um, about, I mean, they break it down by state by state nationally, but all kinds of great information about um, queer kids. Um, Minnesota has unacceptably high levels of harassment that have led to 61% of gender non-conforming children seriously considering suicide. That is a huge number, 61%. Just sit with that, you know. Uh, we're going to do a little activity here. So I'm going to ask some questions um, and then let you think on them for a minute. And then I'm going to ask you some more questions. Um, this is a tool we use to get in our trainings to get people's gears turning. Uh, we're not going to take the full five minutes. We don't have time. So I just want you to look through the questions and think about them a little bit. And then we're going to talk about them. Um, so how do you know what gender you are? Can you describe your gender? When did you first become aware of your gender? Um, how have your family and friends responded to your gender expression? What do you really like about your gender? And what would you change about your gender or other people's perception of your gender? So some quick questions for you. What question was easiest to answer and why? Um, just shout out anybody. And I know there are two number ones there. I keep meaning to fix this slide. <laughs> so what question or questions was easiest to answer and why? Anybody want to share? Nobody? I'll go. Okay. <laughs> um, um, hi, I'm Chelsea. I use they them pronouns. Um, my the easiest question to answer um, is what I really like about my gender. Um, and, and even that one's complicated. I think especially, you know, being a trans person who looks a lot like their assigned gender at birth. Um, <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. And, uh, you know, my gender um, is mine and it's based on so many other parts of myself and my experiences. Um, and yeah, it's mine and it's always mine. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Um, I can go. My name is River and I use the other pronouns. Um, I'd also like to say number four because I'm also trans and look like my gender from birth. But I really like how when I do dress more masculine, how confident I become. Yay. I'm happy for you. Um, what question was hardest to answer and why? Number five will be hi, my name is Hoda. Um, um, number five will be hi, because it's, for me personally, I like my gender, it's like the way I am. I can't, I don't, I don't know what to say. Okay. Um, anybody else? Um, I would say number two, because I feel like I'm always questioning my gender, but, um, I like first became more aware that I was trans like a couple of years ago. Okay. Okay, this is interesting because um, I don't get a lot because I when the settings I do these in, I don't get a lot of people who identify as trans or non-binary. So this is this is a really interesting um, Q and A we're doing here for me. Thank you. <laughs> um, what came up for you during this activity?
Nothing? I'm sure something came up for some of you. Um, for me, um, because I'm cisgender, I think it was interesting how the first four questions were basically defined by how I've been raised and the perceptions that I've been taught throughout my entire life, rather than exploring things for myself, I guess. Like when I define them, I'm like, well, when I was a kid, I was given like a girl toy and that was who I was. So that's just an interesting thing I thought about. Okay, the cis people in the room, have you ever been asked these questions before? Okay, everybody, have you been asked these questions before? Yeah, for sure. But it's, I think especially like in college, you know, and recently graduating, you know, from this thing this last year. Um, yeah, and then when I would disclose and like when people, especially like cis people who are like really well-intentioned and, you know, I disclose that I'm trans, um, they're like, I had no idea. And I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> sometimes, you know, that's intentional, but yeah all the time and you know sometimes you know they ask you know just like wanting to learn more and like that's super great um and sometimes it's not so great but yeah yeah um so when i do this survey um generally what i get are a lot of people who are like no 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 um the point of the survey is to kind of put uh cis folks into the shoes of a non-binary person a trans person because um, nobody asked me what do I like about my gender or nobody asked me can I describe my gender they're like oh you know this is some dude um, but they ask trans folks they ask non-binary folks well what didn't you like or what do you like or why do you do this or why do you do that um, and also trans non-binary folks ask themselves these questions all the time you know they ask these questions of themselves as they're trying to figure out their path forward as as you know for those of you in the room as you were trying to um find your place in life and who you are. These are questions you probably have, or similar questions you probably ask yourself. I don't want to assume. Um, but yeah, this is this really kind of puts, you know, cis straight folks in the shoes for briefly of what this kids go through um, in their in their daily life. But also adults, you know, um, it's not just a 15 year old that is trans or non-binary. It's not just that person. That's not just college people. People in their 50s, 60s and 70s come out um, in life as trans or non-binary, or I myself didn't come out as, as a queer person until later in life. Um, living in the closet sucks, I'll tell you that. So some terminology, y'all are going to know some of these terms, so bear with me, it's a little bit of base setting, but you know, for the most part, I'm sure everybody here knows what a lesbian or a gay person is. Um, transgender is a term for people whose gender identity differs from the sex they're assigned at birth, uh, so if a person's assigned female at birth, does that mean they identify as a male or a man? Not necessarily, but what we do know is they don't identify as, as a female, as a woman. Um, and then queer is a term that's uh, often, that's used as an umbrella term to describe anyone who's not straight or cisgender or the community as a whole. Um, I identify as a queer person. There are plenty of, of people who are LGBT that identify as queer people, um, others that don't. Uh, the one takeaway on this is um, if you are a cis straight person, please do not use queer when referring to people because um, it's been used as a slur against us for so long. Um, we can use it, but please don't use it when referring to us. Now I'm going to come back to bisexual. So bisexual are individuals who are physically or emotionally sexually attracted to multiple sexes or gender. Um, what's a pansexual person? Anyone? So who watched Schitt's Creek? Any Schitt's Creek watchers in here? No? Oh, this is weird. Um, so a pansexual person is a person who's attracted to people regardless of gender. So as a bisexual person, we're attracted to multiple um, sexes, genders. Um, but uh, pansexual people's attraction is regardless of gender. It just doesn't matter to them. They're attracted to the person, not necessarily a trait or a characteristic. 
Um, pansexuals term has been around for over a hundred years, but it's really come into a lot more common usage in the last, I'd say 10 years or so, um, because bisexual was felt to be a little transphobic. Um, you're bisexual, you're attracted to men and women. Where does that leave uh, trans folks or non-barrier folks? Um, you know, we're attracted to multiple sexes or genders. Um, so anyways, uh, pansexual is re attraction regardless of, and it felt it was felt to be more inclusive. So any questions about that? In the Schitt's Creek reference, um, for people who know, um, there's two characters that are talking and there was an assumption that one was gay and he's pansexual and he's describing it in terms of wine. He prefers, he likes the wine, not the label. So um, if you haven't seen that scene, Google it, Schitt's Creek, David, wine, not the label, and it is sweet. So what is the binary framework? The binary framework is what we've been raised in here um, and other places too. You know, we have men's shoes, women's shoes, men's room, women's room, uh, men's pants, women's pants. Um, this is the binary we've been raised in. So we have assigned sex. This is what the doctor sees at birth. This is a male, this is a female. Identity um, is a person's sense of who they are, a man or a woman. Expression is how they show themselves to the world, masculine or feminine. And attracted to, a male is attracted to women, a female is attracted to men. Now this is the binary framework. I'm not saying this is, I'm agreeing necessarily with the idea that one would present one way or the other. I'm just saying this is the binary framework. So my question to you is, um, are there two sexes? Are there just two sexes? Anybody? Yes or no? There are intersex people. Thank you. Yes. Next slide. There are more than two sexes. There are intersex. Um, and uh, intersex is a term for a variety of conditions where someone's reproductive or sexual anatomy does not fit what we determine to be typical male or female biology. Some intersex people know that they're intersex from birth. Um, the external characteristics um, are not necessarily like, say, a penis or a vulva. Um, but some people um, have what we would consider typical anatomy, male, female, penis, vulva type anatomy, but they don't not find out they're intersex until later in life. Like um, they come to puberty and their body doesn't um, change in the way we've typically determined to be male or female. Um, and after some investigating, we may find that a person, say, has testes where the ovaries would be. Um, so not everybody knows their intersex um, at birth. Uh, but what does this tell us? The main point this tells us the existence of intersex people shows that the idea of two clear distinct sexes, the sex binary, is a myth. It is not real. So gender, though, what is it? Sex and gender are two different things. Um, Gender identity is a person's internal sense of themselves as a man, woman, both or neither, oftentimes influenced by their sex assigned at birth. Um, cisgender, it's a term for people whose gender matches the sex they're assigned at birth. They're assigned male at birth and they, um, they're a boy, they're a man, it fits, it all clicks, it all makes sense. Um, transgender folks are a term for people whose identity differs from the sex they're assigned at birth. The example given is assigned female at birth, raised as a girl or woman in the binary framework, but does not identify as a girl or a woman. Do they identify as a man? Maybe some of them do, but not all of them. The main point is they don't they don't identify as female. Um, any questions on those? I know this is really nuts and bolts, um, but you know the schools I go into, there's so much um, lack of clarity around these issues. I have to sit there and kind of like beat beat it over their heads in order to get the results I need um, for later on in the presentation. So gender identity, um, sometimes transgender people change names, pronouns, take hormones, enter surgically alter the bodies, but none of these are required to be transgender. There's no one way to be a transgender person. There's also no one way to be a cisgender person. We think about fashion. Heels in the 1500s were men's apparel. Now heels are something that women wear. Um, there was a time in this country where men wore pants, women wore dresses. Um, and that's not the case um, anymore or so much. Um, there's no one way to be a cisgender person either. These are all constructs. And there's a lot of identities out there, non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer. These are terms used by people who experience their gender identity or expression falling outside of the categories or man or woman. Now, two-spirit's a term used by some, not all, indigenous people. I want to emphasize that as a native person. Um, not, not all tribes recognize two-spirit. Um, some tribes, my neighboring tribe from where I'm from, recognizes men and women. That's it. My tribe recognizes four plus. 
Um, Two-spirit marks return to native traditions that historically recognize more than two genders. The big takeaway on two-spirit, it is a term for native folks only. If you are not a native person, this is not a term for you to be using. Same goes for spirit animal, please stop. Uh, transgender man, transgender woman, we went over that a little earlier. Um, so yeah, so these are some transgender identities. There are so many out there. There are, there are terms for people like, well, what's this identity? I'm just like, wow, that one's a new one to me. I'm gonna have to break out Google. Um, but the nice thing is people are more comfortable finding the one that fits for them. Now, why is this important? I mean, why? Why do I do this? Why do I go into schools and talk about this? Well, one, gender affirmation is standard care supported by American Medical Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, and American Psychological Association. Forcing transgender people to fit within the sex or assigned at birth causes substantial psychological pain and is medically unethical. Forcing gay kids to be straight, bi kids to be straight, lesbian kids to be straight, queer kids to be straight. Forcing people to be something they are not is harmful, it is medically unethical, and it is wrong. People are who they are, and they need to be treated as such. Now, um, these serious health risks, um, the psychological pain, um, is uh, greatly reduced when kids are allowed to socially transition in ways that are consistent with their gender identity, and they receive support from parents, schools, and peers. This is about safety. So much of this presentation is, you know, terms and definitions, but the reality of it is, it's all about safety. National studies show that 70% of transgender students do not feel safe at school. They're harassed. They want to simply do things like, you know, go to the restroom, um, change clothes in peace. That's what they want. And they're harassed and they're bullied. They're targeted for discrimination. Um, transgender teens experience high rates of depression, anxiety, and self-harm, all of which are in due part due to discrimination, stigma, and social rejection. And there are also potential medical issues. When you have a child who's told that you can use the one single user restroom on the other side of the school in the teacher's faculty lounge, um, and you have to ask permission to use it, that kid is not gonna go to the restroom often enough or as often as they need to. They're gonna withhold water or they're not gonna go to the restroom. They're gonna be dehydrated. They're gonna have bladder issues. Um, when they could simply just use the restroom they identify with. Um, and they should be able to, and they need to be allowed to. And quite honestly, in the state of Minnesota, the schools are required to allow children, allow people to use the restroom that they identify with. Um, in Minnesota transgender and gender non-conforming student make up nearly 3% of student population. And it doesn't matter where it, where it is. Uh, it could be in St. Peter, it could be in Bemidji, it could be in Duluth, it could be in the Twin Cities, it could be in Ogilvy, Minnesota. It's 3%, 3%, 3%. Um, so I'm going to update this information. I've got an intern coming in to do this, but the 2019 MDE student survey showed that 33.7% of LGBTQ 11th graders had considered attempting suicide in the past year. That's huge. Um, and it's unacceptable. Uh, when transgender and gender non-conforming students, those numbers rise to 39.8%. Um, these are unacceptable numbers and we need to do something about it. Uh, in the last, well, since November, uh, three of the schools that I work with have lost children to depression, um, LGBTQ kids to depression, um, which is devastating. Um, they're trying their best and these kids still end up hurting themselves or worse. Um, and that's unacceptable. We have to do something about that. Why does all this matter? Now, obviously, you know, this is geared towards teachers, but it's geared towards everybody. Mutual care and respect. Um, it's about student safety and it's part of an educator's job and it's part of your job as a human to be kind and try to be nice for others. Gender expression. So we kind of covered this earlier, but just a reminder, there's no one way to look at certain gender identity. Um, we can communicate our identities through dress and expression, but it's not, you know, it's just how we communicate and show ourselves to the world. Um, gender expression also, um, we have to think about how it works within given cultures, how we show ourselves in different cultures. Here in the United States, two heterosexual men don't walk down the street holding their friend's hand. Um, they're male, you know, two heterosexual men are not gonna hold each other's hands going on the street. They're not gonna kiss each other um, goodbye or to greet each other. And in other parts of the world, that's common. It's very normal. Um, and, and honestly, I. Feel like we are in such a prudish touch star society it's nice to be able to get a hug and not you know just i want to hug my friend it's nice it's comforting it feels good for some of us not everybody's a hugger i get that but 
two two straight people shouldn't be like looked at in some sort of weird way because they hug each other. Um, that's just hurtful. Toxic masculinity has done a lot of great harm to us. Um, now, our gender expression may be communicated through name, pronouns, clothing, behaviors, mannerisms, et cetera, but there's no one way to be any gender or any expression. So pronouns. Pronoun usage, when I started doing these trainings in schools, I had a lot of questions. You know, they, them, singular, they, them, singular, or they, them, plural. It's just plural. It just is. It's always been plural. Um, the reality of it is, is they, them has been used as a singular for a very long time. William Shakespeare used it as a singular. Jane Austen used it as a singular. Um, whether we are in that camp of no, it's, it's, it's a plural, it's a plural, it's a pearl. We've had somebody pass us going down the road at 90 miles an hour and you're like, whoa, they're insane. They're gonna cause an accident. Um, because we didn't see who it was. We couldn't assign a gender to them, but we knew it was one person driving the car. Um, even in high school, I remember my buddy going to the bathroom, people would be like, where's Tim? I'm like, oh, they went to the can. Um, we do it all the time without really even thinking about it. So. Uh, the big question I get now and one of the weird, you know, one of the, the pe thing people get weird about is mixed pronouns like my, he, they's. Um, and I noticed there are a couple of people who used uh, some mixed pronouns when we were talking earlier. So do you have questions about mixed pronouns or why people use mixed pronouns? Or how to use them when somebody introduces themselves with a mixed pronoun? How to use them. Like okay, so when somebody gives mixed pronouns, um, what they're telling you is they're comfortable with more than one pronoun, obviously. Um, some people go order of operations. Oh, this person said he, they, so he's probably what they're more comfortable with. They have something they use. For some people, that's the case. For some people, they want to mix and match, um, you know, just mix them up. Um, you know, I'm just like he, they pronouns. And I just leave it at that. Some people will be like, oh, my pronouns are he, they. Mix them up if you uh, mix them up is great. Um, but uh, if they say, you know, I had a coworker who would be like, you know, they'd introduce themselves by name and they're like, my pronouns are they, she, they is preferred, she, if you must, you might get that. Um, I don't necessarily use they um, because of any gender identity specific things. I, I have some gender queer tendencies, but more of the reason I use they is for visibility. Um, when I go into a room and I say he, they pronouns, what I'm saying is, I acknowledge pronouns, I use pronouns, I want to hear your pronouns and I will accept your pronouns. And it normalizes pronoun usage. Um, so how do you find out somebody's pronouns? Well, guess. Ask, yeah. How do you find out somebody's chosen name? Yeah. Um, should you require somebody to give you their pronouns? Yeah. yeah, we don't want to require people to use to give pronouns. Some people just don't want to. They don't want to play the pronoun game. Okay, fine. Okay, you have your opinion. You have your thoughts about it. Other people um, may not be comfortable. Maybe they're not ready. Um, I like to tell people like when you are passing, when you're, when you're um, asking students pronouns or asking colleagues pronouns, use something like, you know, hey, my pronouns are he, they, you know, um, if, what are yours if you'd like to share? Or um, if you're, you know, if you, if you want to share or something like that, make it more of an option. Because when we talk about, so my, my big example is Robert Bobby, assigned, you know, Robert was the birth name, Bobby is their chosen name. So you have this person who is still using Robert, still using he, hims. Now, when you say, um, when you kind of put it in a situation where, giving the pronoun is not optional. You want that pronoun. What this child is now in a situation of either outing themselves before they're ready, uh, my pronouns are they, them, or keeping themselves in the closet, um, my pronouns are he, him. Um, we don't wanna be in a situation where putting a, a child or anybody um, in, in that area of where they have to out themselves before they're ready or discuss something that maybe they're not just, they're not ready or this is just not the time they wanna do it or forcing them to stay in a closet. So make it optional. Um, don't make it a requirement. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I know this is really kind of nuts and bolts, but it is so surprising when I go into schools, um, people who work with our children every day, there's a struggle here. Teachers are getting better and better at this. Um, 
And part of it is just due to the climate this last, you know, two and a half years, almost three years now, they almost have bigger fish to fry. They're like, okay, fine. They, them, I'll use they, them. I'll use Bobby. It just doesn't matter to me. The rest of my cl class forgot how to be a student and I have to work on that. But I'm having a lot of pushback from administrators. I'm getting a lot of pushback from school boards. Um, I work in a, I'm working in a school right now where a school administrator actually went through the school and ripped down rainbow flags. Um, they told teachers they could not have all or welcome signs up. Um, they made them turn their safe space signs to the side so the class can't view them from their desks. These are hate crimes. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, but I'm working in this environment and um, it sucks. It's really painful. So dead names. Um, does anybody want to give a definition for a dead name? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like uh, the name, um, a name you usually assign to you at birth, um, and you know, not necessarily for like a trans person, but like oftenly known, you know, for trans and non-binary folks, um, it's a name that is they are uncomfortable with using. Um, you know, it can make them dysphoric, um, and then you know they have you know their own chosen name, um, but then they then they mean people. Um, have a, yeah, a lot of damage. Yeah, um, we never use a dead name. If we know that Bobby is this person's name, we don't use Robert. Um, if nobody, if, if you're in a room with people um, and, and nobody knows them by their dead name, you don't ever disclose a dead name. Um, Bobby is who they are. Um, there are situations uh, in the previous, the previous one uh, training I just did, um, somebody was like, I had this person introduce themselves to me and I didn't recognize them. And they're like, well, we know each other and I didn't get it and I didn't get it and I didn't get it. And I was like, couldn't make the connection because I'm looking at that going, I don't know this person because their outward presentation is, is who they are, not who they used to present as. And so another person was like, well, that was so-and-so you don't recognize them because and um, is that dead naming? Yeah, but you know they're they're trying to help, um, and so that, that was kind of an ish, iffy question, um, iffy situation. Um, it's better for the person who who gives their chosen name to kind of in their own way and own time um, explain it or open themselves if necessary. But we have to be comfortable with the fact that sometimes we're uncomfortable. This makes me uncomfortable. I can't figure this out. I don't know this, or I feel weird about that, or what about? We have to be okay with our personal discomfort in these situations, because if we dead name a person, we are causing harm. Dead naming somebody repeatedly, um, outing person, um, misusing pronouns are forms of harassment um, and need to be treated as such. And this doesn't go just for students and kids in schools. This goes for your coworkers. This goes for friends. This goes for people you meet in your day-to-day -day lives. Now, why do we do this? Why does this matter? Um, like I said earlier, this is about safety. Um, so Texas University did this huge study in 2018. I'm trying to find a newer study because I don't like using a study that's four years old. I want new information. But anyways, when transgender youth are allowed to use their chosen name in places like work, school, home, with friends, the risk of depression and suicide drops. Excuse me. Young people who use their name in all four areas experience 71% fewer symptoms of severe depression. 71% is not a small number. That is massive. This is not like a 2% or a 3% type thing, 71%. 34% decrease in reported thoughts of suicide and a 65% decrease in suicidal attempts. When I say this is about safety, I actually mean it. Um, it's not hyperbole. Transgender and non-binary youth with access to binder, shapewear, gender-affirming clothing reported lower rates of attempting suicide than transgender or non-binary with youth without. Using correct names and pronouns saves lives, period. Encourage coworkers, encourage friends, encourage family to use a person's name and pronouns, um, the correct ones. Um, so as Minnesotans, we address a group of people by you guys. Anybody more than two people is you guys. We're in Minnesota, it's what we do, um, but we need to move away from that. You guys, even if we lived in a binary framework, strict binary, men and women are the only two things that exist. There are no trans folks or no non-binary folks. Um, you guys excludes half the population. We need to be more inclusive in our day-to-day -day language. Um, use non-gender terms. 
um, everyone, students, learners, people. I love using y'all. Y'all is one of the most welcoming terms in the entire world. Y'all are welcome to come over. Y'all can, <laughs> y'all can do this thing. It's such a welcoming term. And I know that it's got this like Southern hick thing to it, but man, y'all is one of the most welcoming and inclusive terms out there. Um, we don't want to do things like separating groups by gender. Um, we want to ask for things like chosen names and pronouns, but not require it. We encourage schools to have gender inclusion policies because uh, there are three basic student rights. Um, we have the right to change names, pronouns, and gender in school records. Uh, there are school records you cannot change a child's name in. They have to match the birth name, the birth certificate name, the legal name. Um, these are things that get reported to the state of Minnesota, things like um, birth uh, report cards and things like that. You can't, you can't change names on those legal documents. But in any other space, a child should be able to change their name and use the name they want to go by. Um, teachers are very comfortable using nicknames. Like when they do roll call and they'd be like, you know, calling out names. My name is actually not Dan, it's Roland. You know, they'd be like, Roland, I'm like, I go by Dan. Roland's my dad's name. And they're like, okay, fine, Dan. And they just start using Dan. Um, teachers are familiar with using the not birth name, the not legal name. They are. Um, but all too often, ambiguity is the problem. Um, when a person looks ambiguous and a person doesn't look like we expect them or act like we expect them to be, um, it makes them nervous, it makes them feel weird, it makes them feel sorts of ways about calling this person Bobby or Sarah when they look like they should be a robber or a mark. Um, people don't do well with ambiguity. Um, so we need to be more comfortable with ambiguity with that. Um, can anybody describe the difference between a nickname and a dead name? So a nickname is just something I like Dan. I just like going by Dan. If you call me Roland, it doesn't trigger any responses. But when you call Bobby Robert, it triggers things. Um, that's not who they are. Um, is it who they ever were? For some people, sure, I was Robert, but now I'm Bobby. Other people, it's like, no, I was never Robert. I've always been Bobby. Um, so we want to make sure that we are using um, that name. A nickname is just, it's just something we like going by. Um, it doesn't cause any real responses. So we want to keep that in mind. They're not the same. Students also have the right to dress, participate fully in activities. Um, every kid has the right to participate in the activity of the gender they identify with. Um, and then the right to full and equal use of restrooms and locker rooms that match their gender identity. A uh, quick way to get sued and lose is to not allow a student to use the locker room or the restroom that they identify with um, as far as their gender. Um, gender inclusion policies must include professional development targeted to all teachers and staff so the district can consistently meet the needs of gender uh, diverse students. Um, you know, they bring me into schools all across the state to do these trainings um, because it's the right thing to do. And so school teachers, you know, teachers in general have been just more and more on board with this the problem that I'm having is with school boards and administration who are having feels. And school boards are getting really, really rough right now. Um, and it's, it's going to be something that I'm going to have to deal with more on a day-to-day -day basis in my work because I'm having school boards say, no, you can't do this training. Um, no, you can't talk to our staff about gender diverse students. Um, so this is, this is a struggle that we're dealing with at all front and many students and teachers are dealing with. Lack of queer, uh, queer, boy, lack of clear and well implemented policies expose school districts to lawsuits. School districts have been forced to pay millions for discrimination based on gender identity. Does anybody really mint win when a school is sued and loses, you know, loses the case and pays out $1.3 million? Honestly, that student didn't really win. Um, sure, you know, the school is being forced to make changes, but it would have been simpler for everybody involved if the school had just done it to begin with. It had been easier for that child instead of having to go through what could have been years of harassment. It's easier for the school to not have to deal with all the legal battles. It's just easier all around. Uh, the Minnesota Human Rights Act prohibits discrimination or harassment in education based on gender expression, actual or perceived gender identity, or actual or perceived sexual orientation. Um, and Minnesota Safe and Supportive Schools Act states that all students have the right to attend school in a safe and supportive environment where they can learn and have equal access to equal opportunities. Minnesota has some really great protections in place. 
either through um, various acts, which I'd prefer to go through is have the legislature pass something or um, through le uh, legal action. But we have great protections in place. Um, they do need improved on. Um, but just because uh, it doesn't state it in a Minnesota Department of Education guideline or just because there's not an act doesn't mean we can't just do the right thing and we should. Um, I did some trainings in Wisconsin. Wisconsin does not have these protections, but the school I was in had these in place because they just felt it was the right thing to do. They didn't have the legislator tell them to do it. What are risks of not having this policies? It's hard on students. When a child doesn't know classroom to classroom, if their name or pronouns is to be respected, it's difficult for them. Um, they may be great in middle school. Teachers are accepting, everybody's kind of on board with it but they've heard that when they move to high school that there are multiple teachers who aren't on board with it or this or that or the other. And that causes anxiety. Am I gonna be treated the same when I move to this other classroom or to this other school? So having that policy is just comforting and reduces anxiety and stress. Um, teachers, it reduces struggles for teachers when they just know this is how you treat a gender non-conforming student. This is how you ask for a pronoun. This is how you treat a dead name. This is how you this is how you respond when you have a student repeatedly using a misgendering a person or using a dead name. Um, having these policies in place provides support for them. And then kids, if they're not educated on other people, it can create a hostile environment. Um, things are getting better in some ways, there is more acceptance, um, at least of maybe going to a restroom or using a pronoun. There's still a long way to go. There is still so much harassment. There's still so much discrimination against these kids and adults too. You know, in the workplace, if you are an adult and you come out as a non-binary person or a trans person, you have the same, you, they often have the same struggles as these kids. It's just a different environment. 78% of LGBTQ youth report having at least one in-person LGBTQ affirming space. That's great. That's a pretty big number, 78%. It should be 100 and it should be far more than one space. But when we think about it, you know, as students, when we were kids, you know, there's that one adult that got us. There's that one adult that understood us and they, you know, whether it was a teacher or, or maybe an uncle or an aunt or, or whatever, there was that one adult that got us. And that was such a nice feeling to know that. Um, it should be more than that, though. Um, so we're at the question stage. Oh, let's see, we're here. So this is my email, um, Dan at Outfront. Um, KQ uh, is my, it works in my department. Um, KQ does these trainings for students. Um, they work with the student side of education. I work with the non-student side of education. So here we are. Hello. Um, where are we for time? We have about five minutes here. Is there something you didn't hear or something you would have liked to heard or just a question in general that maybe um, Outfront can help address or, or something like that? Um, is there like a right way to ask questions? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Is there like a right way to ask like non-gendered or like trans people without being rude? To ask them their, their pronouns? Uh, stuff like that, I don't know, without yeah. being rude. So, so yeah, there, we, we want to make people comfortable. So when we just ask, you know, we introduce ourselves and we try, we try to model things like pronouns, like, hi, I'm Dan, he, they pronouns, you know, what's your name and your pronouns if you'd like, or if, you know, um, you know, just not making it a requirement is nice because I want to know your name at the very least. It's easier for me to talk to you. And it'd be nice if I could use the pronouns that you would prefer. So, um, and normalize it. Don't just be like, well, that person over there is non-binary or transgender in my eyes and how I see them. So I'm gonna ask them, ask everybody. You know, when you see Robert walking down the street and he's wearing his suit and tie and all, you know, carrying his briefcase or whatever Robert's do, I don't know what Robert's do. But you, you see that, that, that cis that we see as a cis man, you know, make sure you're asking him too, like, hey, what's your name, you know, and your pronouns if you'd like to share. Just do it. To, all the time, not just with somebody we would assume to be uh, trans or non-binary. We don't ask somebody, are you trans or are you non-binary? That's rude, that's very rude, we don't do that. They'll disclose that if they want to. Um, it's the same way we don't ask somebody, are you gay? Um, pretty rude, we don't do that either. Um, they'll let you know if they want you to know. 
Um, but just asking in a gentle way that that allows them to, if they're comfortable to, if they want to, because it shows that you care, it shows that you are interested, and it shows that you're trying to do things to make them feel comfortable. I mean, is it so for so there are people who are in the room who identified um, as not cis, is there a way you like people to ask you your pronouns? Is there something you're comfortable with? Um, I guess for me, as you know, a trans adult um, who works in education, I do a lot more of the modeling of, you know, including my pronouns so that, you know, my trans students or like all my students can feel comfortable um, with that. And thankfully, I have really great coworkers who I don't always have to initiate that. A lot of times they initiate that. So that's great. And especially, you know, this last week of like getting to know new people, like we've gone around the room, everyone said their name and shared their pronouns that they wanted. Um, so only if they were comfortable. So I think that's been the best for me, uh, but I haven't had to model and, you know, come out so that my other students like, feel comfortable as well. So. Thank you. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes left. Um, what else? I mean, it doesn't even have to be related to these slides if there's something that, that you have, you know, in thinking about this subjects or or if there's something about the slide. I'm happy to chat. I have a question. Yeah. So if I if you're in a scenario with like someone who has like changed pronouns or names and someone else misgenders them, is it like appropriate? Like if they're not saying anything to themselves, is it appropriate for me to be like, you're like, these are the, you know what I mean? Like to correct someone if the other person hasn't taken that step to do it themselves, even if they're openly out? Right in front of their face? Like, yeah, if it's like three people talking and one has changed pronouns and told people that they changed it. And somebody I've corrected, I've corrected people, um, not necessarily right in front of their face, but to the side. Mm -hmm. um, just like, hey, you know, that's Bobby, they go by Bobby, you know, don't don't use that other name, their pronouns are they, them. Mm -hmm. um, because we don't want to create a situation where all of a sudden Bobby's feeling like on the spot or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but we do want to, we do want to be an ally and we do want to support and correct. Um, and I, so my, my mother-in-law would misgender my child. My, my oldest is non-binary trans. Um, and my mother-in-law would be like, she, she'd misgender them. And we'd be like, they, and she's talking, they, she's talking, they, she's talking, you know, Ivy. Um, you know, we, we just, we just did it. We did it right in front of the kid, um, because we were so sick of it. Um, <laughs> it's like, come on, lady, just, just do the right thing for a hot second here. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of, if you're able to kind of do it to the side, it might be a little, a little less awkward for all involved, but sometimes just a quick pronoun, you know, pronoun correction um, is appropriate. Don't, don't beat that horse too hard right in front of everybody though. Um, do a pull aside if possible. Because um, students will do this too, like in a classroom, they'll be like, Robert, and the teachers will be like, Bobby, you know better. You know, they're like, he, and they're like, they, you know, better. Um, do we need to talk about this? Um, those things happen. Um, but making a big scene out of things makes everybody feel a little uncomfortable and awkward, too. I don't know if anybody else has a different opinion or has their own thoughts on this, please do share. Um, yeah, I can say for me, especially, like, if someone dead names me or uses the wrong pronouns and someone like, does it like right in front of me, like corrects them right in front of me? I can say, like, I get really uncomfortable because I can feel like the whole mood changes and I'm like, I don't really know what to say because I don't like speaking up for myself. So, yeah, especially like the pull to the side thing helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I like the own like context is also like really important. Like, um, you know, like I'm originally from Iowa, and when I the few times I do go back to Iowa, um, I'm using she her pronouns for only just like you know for my own safety. And you know, I have a lot of great friends in Iowa who always use they them for me. Uh, but that's um, you know sometimes be like, hey, like I know you want to respect me and I love you for it, but like this is a time when you can misgender me, um, and I need you to for like my comfort um, level. Um, but yeah, also like on context, you know, um, you know, I've been in situations, you know, if there's another trans person in there, you know, like being attacked. And if it's not like more of like a passive conversation where the person who's misgendering them, it's not like on accident or, you know, like a bad habit and it's really intentional, you know, 
learning when to pull aside and when someone like needs to advocate for them, someone to advocate for them in that moment and, you know, doing so appropriately, but, you know, there's nuance to everything. Thank you. Okay, so we're at time. Um, it's my email. Can you all see my email? Did it show up in the chat up there? I actually wrote it on the board. Okay. But... Oh, okay. Thank you. So yeah, um, please, uh, if, you, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, um, please email me. And if you bomb something in here, you're just like, oh, I question what you're talking about there. I'd also like to know that too, for the simple reason. Um, I can't make these better. If people don't tell me where it could be better. Um, I appreciate you all being here today. Thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Care. Thank you.